So uh, today we are going to review some aspects of the head and neck anatomy uh, that are relevant for neurosurgical approaches and pathologies. The boundary between the head and the neck runs along the inferior border of the mandible, uh, as well as the tip of the mastoid and the external occipital protuberance. And the neck terminates inferiorly at uh, the jugular notch of the sternum, the clavicle and the spinous process of the seventh cervical vertebra. First, we are going to look at the anatomy of the cervical vertebra as a basic structure of the, these regions. And we see the seventh cervical vertebra uh, that form part of the uh, head and neck. The first two have a very different configuration uh, than the <coughs> other five vertebra, being the first uh, C1 or atlas and the second C2 or axis. And all of them are closely uh, related to the vertebral artery, which passes um, anterior to the seventh cervical vertebra, and then um, inside um, thr or through the transverse foramina of the upper six cervical vertebra. And we can distinguish th three segments of the vertebral artery here. The first segment, or B1, is from its origin in the subclavian artery, in the right or left side, uh, to the uh, foramen transversarium of the sixth cervical vertebra. Then the second segment, or B2, runs through the transverse foramina of C2 to C6. And then the, the third segment that we can see in this picture partially runs above the transverse foramina of C2, which is oblique uh, and different from the transverse uh, horizontal position of the other uh, transverse foramens, and then goes up and passes through um, the transverse foramen of C1. But we don't see this uh, segment completely. And in this view, uh, we see that this segment, the B3 segment, continues uh, around um, the atlanto-occipital junction before it enters the dura mater and then forms the B4 segment. Um, so we, um, we see here um, the first cervical vertebra or atlas, which is the widest one um, in a view from above. In, and this is unique in having nobody has an anterior arch with an anterior tubercle, a posterior arch with a posterior tubercle and uh, a transverse process with, for, with the transverse foramen and um, a lateral mass in which we can see the superior articular facet for the occipital condyle. In an inferior view of the occipital condyle, we see the uh, articular surface uh, for the lateral mass of the atlas. And he, here we see a posterior view of the atlanto occipital junction with the B3 segment of the vertebral artery, which is lateral to the lateral atlanto occipital joint, passing through the transverse foramen of C2, transverse foramen of C1, and then around the lateral mass of the atlas. This is a, an oblique view illustrating the breathy free segment of the vertebral artery with three portions a vertical portion between the transfer foramen of C2 and C1, then a horizontal portion, portion around the lateral mass of the atlas, and an oblique portion which is going to reach the dura mater and um, enter intra intradural. So in a view from below, C1 articulates anteriorly and laterally with C2, has a facet anteriorly to articulate with the odontoid and two inferior facets to articulate with the superior facets of C2. And C2 has a, bo has, has a body with an odontoid process, transverse process, um, lamina, spinous process, and the superior articular processes which hide the transverse process. So the vertebral artery has to run from medial to lateral to go through the C1 transverse foramen. 
This is a superior view of the Atlanta axial articulations in which we see the transverse foramen of C1, but we cannot see the transverse foramen of C2, which makes the vertical portion of V3 ascend superiorly and laterally to pass from the transverse foramen of C1 to C2. In a view of C2 from below, um, this, uh, it shows the transverse foramen here, and um, the superior articular uh, process of C2 is located at the level of the transverse foramen, but the inferior articulations uh, that articulate with C3 are behind the transverse foramen. The other cervical vertebrae, this is C3, are similar um, in configuration with a body, a transverse foramen in the transverse process. The articular processes, lamina, and spinous processes. The posterior lateral leaps of the bodies of C3 to C7 project upwards, forming the uncinate processes. This is important because the uncinate processes are related anteriorly to the intervertebral foramina. And the configuration of the structures in the intervertebral foramina are um, the vertebral artery runs anteriorly and the cervical nerves run posteriorly from C3 to C7. So um, the vertebral artery is lateral to the vertebral bodies and anterior uh, to the articular processes from C3 to C7 and lateral to the C1, C2 joint. This is a lateral image um, of the relationship of the vertebral artery anterior um, to the articular processes and lateral to the atlantoaxial joint. Transnasal or transoral approaches can access the upper <laughs> cervical spine and need to take into the account the, the important relationships of the vertebral artery, which is lateral, but also the relationship of the carotid, which is anterior medial in this portion uh, to the vertebral artery and all the structures uh, from the jugular foramen. So now focusing on the dissection of some topographical anatomy of the neck, this is the most superficial muscle of the neck, which is the platysma coli, innervated by the uh, cervical branch of the facial nerve. And if we remove this muscle that we have retracted here, then we, we see all the structures below, and um, we see here um, some nerve filaments, which are the cervical branch of uh, the facial nerve. And then another small nerve here, very important, which is the uh, marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve, which innervates, in this specimen we can see this branch innervates the musculature of the uh, lower lip and the cervical branch is the one that innervates the platysma coli. So injury to the marginal branch of the facial nerve may cause uh, a symmetry of the smile. So we need to be very careful in placing the incisions in this area, approximately two centimeters below the angle of the mandible to avoid injury of the marginal bra branch of the facial nerve. And then um, it's very important the topographical anatomy of the neck uh, because uh, we can see several, we can distinguish several triangles which are of importance in accessing pathologies in this area. And the sternocleidomastoid muscle is the most important structure in dividing um, the triangles of the neck because it divides the anterior lateral part of the neck in the anterior triangle and posterior triangle. The anterior triangle um, runs between the midline mandible and the anterior limit of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the posterior triangle between the clavicle, the posterior aspect of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius muscle. And also an, an important structure to know this, this anatomy is the hyoid. The hyoid divides the anterior triangle of the neck in two, which are two compartments, the suprahyoid compartment and the infrahyoid compartment. The suprahyoid compartment is divided by the digastric muscle into two triangles, 
um, the submental triangle and the submandibular triangle that we see better in this dissection. We see the anterior and posterior belly of the digastric muscle. The submental triangle, uh, which is, uh, contains mainly fat and lymphatic nodes, and the submandibular triangle, which is more complex in structure, but what is important is that we can see here that the hypoglossal nerve um, can be seen approximately in the vertex of this triangle and is passing in front of the carotid artery here, below the posterior belly of the gastric muscle. Another important, other sport uh, structure is the homohyoid muscle, which divides the uh, infrahyoid uh, triangle in two triangles, which are Im of importance in neurosurgery. The one that is above the homohyoid triangle is the carotid triangle, where we are going to find um, most of the times the carotid bifurcation, and the inferior one is called as well um, the homotracheal space or muscular triangle. This image represents the surgical position to approach the common carotid artery bifurcation on the left side. And the carotid triangle is superficially crossed by the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve that is not shown in this picture. Uh, and also the transverse cervical nerve, which is sensitive, and the linguofacial venous trunk that often has to be divided to have access to the carotid bifurcation. We can see here in this image as well uh, the uh, ansa cervicalis, which is formed by the hypoglossal nerve and the cervical plexus. If we retract the submandibular gland, we have a better view of the external carotid artery, the internal carotid artery, which loops here. Um, and the ansa cervicalis that we see here is often uh, superficial to the vein, but in this case is uh, deep to the vein in between the artery and the internal jugular vein. So this is a posterior lateral view of the pharynx and larynx after removal of the spine. And we see the ansa cervicalis here, uh, which comes from the hypoglossal nerve and the cervical spinal nerves to innervate the infrahyoid muscles. Um, so another important structure um, as a reference, apart from the mu muscles and the triangles, is uh, that the carotid bifurcation usually lies in what we call the Farabeff's triangle between the hypoglossal nerve, which runs below digastric muscle, the thyrolinguofacial uh, vein, and the internal jugular vein. The carotid bifurcation usually lies uh, adjacent to the superior border of the uh, thyroid cartilage in approximately 50% of the cases. And uh, by elevating the external carotid artery, we see the carotid bifurcation here, and the tenth nerve runs between the, the carotid artery and the internal jugular vein. High carotid bifurcations lie above the angle of the mandible. So, um, to have access to higher bifurcation of the carotid artery, we can divide this uh, small artery here, which is the, uh, an artery for the sternocleidomastoid muscle, and by that we can retract uh, the hypoglossal nerve up, and then we have, can have access to, um, to higher carotid bifurcation. This is a view of the carotid bifurcation and prevertebral space. This is the right side. Here we have the uh, internal carotid artery and the external carotid artery that has been uh, divided here. And the carotid body is uh, visualized as an oval structure in the carotid bifurcation, while the carotid sinus is an arterial dilation of the internal carotid artery at the bifurcation level. The carotid sinus nerve carries information concerning the pressure and chemical composition of the arterial blood, 
and mainly joins the ninth nerve or glossopharyngeal nerve, but also has an estomosis and joins the 10th nerve and sympathetic chain. The omotracheal region or median cervical region, also called muscular triangle, is located between the omohyoid muscle, sternocleidomastoid muscle, which has been retracted laterally in this picture, and the midline. The jugular arch connects the anterior jugular veins on both sides. And the muscular triangle contains mainly uh, the infra part of the infrahyoid muscles and then the thyroid gland, trachea, and esophagus. And laterally, in the sternocleidomastoid region, which is below uh, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, we can see the common carotid artery, the internal jugular vein, and a structure here crossing behind the carotid artery, which is the thoracic, thoracic duct. The brachial plexus lies here in between the anterior and the middle scalenus muscle. And in this dissection, we retracted uh, the omohyoid muscle and other uh, infrahyoid muscles. We see the, uh, the thyroid gland, the carotid artery, and the internal jugular vein, and the confluence between the subclavian vein and the internal jugular vein, and the thoracic sig duct draining here. Of importance in surgery is that the um, brachiocephalic trunk which gives uh, the common carotid artery and the subclavian artery on the uh, right side can be higher in this place and uh, be into this omotracheal region. So in a view from above, as we would have in surgery to, access, uh, to have access to lesions in this area, uh, the mandible is here, the clavicle has been divided here. We see better the uh, thoracic duct uh, behind the common carotid artery draining into the jugular subclavian junction. So the posterior triangle, as we said before, um, um, is localized in between the um, clavicle, the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid uh, muscle and the trapezius muscle. And in a lateral view, we see this posterior triangle uh, and the most important point of this triangle is what we call the herbs point uh, that can be found approximately at half distance of the superior and inferior insertions of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And the herbs point uh, is important because um, the subcutaneous branches of the uh, cervical plexus pierce the superficial layer of the cervical fascia and they can be used for instance, this is the greater auricular nerve that can be used as a neural graft. The transverse uh, cervical nerves and the um, supracravicular nerves, the lesser occipital nerve, and here, deep to it, the accessory nerve. In a closer view, uh, we can see the accessory nerve here, supraclavicular nerves, and uh, transverse cervical nerve and greater auricular nerves. So uh, a lateral view of the carotid artery through the um, posterior triangle uh, gives access as well to uh, the carotid bifurcation. This is a posterior view of the common carotid artery bifurcation through the posterior cervical triangle, posterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And this is a pr an approach that can be used for a high uh, carotid artery bifurcations. The angle of the mandible would be here. And we need to take care in between the uh, internal jugular vein and the carotid artery. We are going to find the 10th nerve and also crossing uh, the uh, accessory nerve as well as the branches of the uh, cervical plexus. Um, so, the last triangle of the neck is the, uh, what we call the cervical region. We can see here the lesser, des lesser and greater occipital nerves. And when we dissect all these muscles, the trapezius muscle has been removed. This is the splenius cavities. This is the semispinalis cavities. Uh, we go to the deeper part, 
of the suboccipital in the suboccipital triangle, which is bounded by the superior and inferior oblique muscles and the rectus capitis major muscle. And in between them, we can see the vertebral artery and the, um, and the venous plexus, which surrounds this artery. And um, the muscular artery that mainly, that mainly supplies the deep uh, cervical musculature is uh, the deep cervical artery, which anastomoses, often anastomoses with the vertebral artery and the occipital artery, as we see here. This is the deep cervical artery, the vertebral artery, and anastomosing with the occipital artery. And this muscular branch of the vertebral artery can lead to profuse bleeding in some uh, occipital appro suboccipital approaches. Um, so the dorsal ramus of the second cervical nerve gives the greater occipital nerve. And the ventral ramus, which is here, wraps around the vertical portion of the B3 segment of the vertebral artery, where the vertebral artery is lateral to the atlantoaxial joint. Here, the cervical laminas have been removed, um, and the articular processes on the right side, and we see that the cervical nerves run posterior to the vertebral artery um, in this segment. This is B2 seg segment of the vertebral artery. After re division and retraction of the dura mater uh, and the arachnoid, the cerebellum, and the spinal cord are shown in this picture. So it's also important to um, learn um, the vascular anatomy of the head and neck region uh, is very important for bypass surgery as um, being uh, the branches of the sternal carotid artery, sternal maxillary artery, superficial temporal artery, commonly involved in bypass surgeries as well as the sternal carotid and the internal carotid artery. So this is a lateral view of a specimen with the mandible, um, the styloid and the gastric muscles removed. Uh, the oral cavity has been opened and the main branches of the uh, external carotid artery can be distinguished. The superior thyroid artery, which can be used as a vascular graft. The facial, which ha has been cut here. The lingual, we see the terminal branch of the lingual artery. Um, the occipital here. Uh, and the internal maxillary artery, which runs in the um, infratemporal fossa. We see here the two uh, terminal branches of the external carotid artery, the maxillary artery and the superficial temporal artery, which is used commonly used uh, for bypass surgery. And here uh, is relationships uh, with the frontalis branch of the facial nerve. Uh, in this surgical position, uh, position from above, uh, we can see here the orbit, the sylvian fissure. We have drilled part of the middle fossa floor, and we see the internal maxillary artery um, that can be anastomosed to the middle cer uh, cerebra cerebral artery interposing a vascular graft. Um, so the anterior triangle of the neck is also entered in approaches to the cervical spine, and its vascular and neural relationships are very important to minimize complications in this area. So thi in this view from above, after removal of the um, right clavicle, uh, we can have the important references of this anatomy. So in midline, we see the thyroid gland. Um, then we see the great vessels, the carotid artery, and the internal jugular vein that have been divided. The 10th nerve that goes behind these two vessels, we see the anterior uh, scalenus muscle, the phrenic nerve behind this, we see the uh, brachial plexus, the cervical plexus above, and the accessory nerve here. So removal of the uh, right mandible and maxilla shows part of uh, the infratemporal fossa. This is the internal maxillary artery. Part of the pterygoid muscles have been removed. We can see the parapharyngeal space 
and the prevertebral space. Um, the anterior tubercle of the atlas protrudes right here in the prevertebral space and behind the oral cavity and serves as a superior attachment of the longus coli muscle. Longus capitis muscle is going to be right lateral to the longus coli muscle, which is in midline. The parapharyngeal space is divided by the styloid fascia, which is continuous with the styloid muscles divided here in pre and post styloid compartments. The pre styloid compartment, medial to the medial pterygoid muscle, is filled with fat and contains branches of the ascending pharyngeal and facial arteries and branches from the glossopharyngeal nerve. This is a view of the styloid fascia after removal of the pterygoid muscles behind the branches of the third division of the trigeminal nerve and internal maxillary artery. The postyloid compartment is also call, called infrapetrosal, is posterior to the styloid fascia, inferior to the petrous bone, and medial to the mastoid tip. Some of the important structures in the, in the area are the superior aspect of the cervical segment of the internal carotid artery, jugular vein, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th cranial nerves. We see here the 9th cranial nerve anterior to the internal carotid, 10th cranial nerve is posterior, and 11th is crossing the internal jugular vein, anterior but sometimes is posterior to it. The 12th cranial nerve surrounds both carotid arteries above the hyoid bone and below the digastric muscle. Dividing the sternocleidomastoid artery, which is branch of the occipital artery, just above the hypoglossal nerve, aids in safely retracting the nerve superiorly in approaches to the carotid artery. So the postyloid compartment from behind, after removal of the cervical spine, Uh, reveals that the sympathetic ganglion and the trunk are the most medial structures uh, in this area. And then we have here the tenth nerve running in between the jugular vein and the carotid artery behind them. These are the cervical uh, spinal nerves, the accessory nerve here running behind the jugular vein in this uh, side on this side and anterior to it on this side. And in a natural view of the same specimen, the hypoglossal nerve, which is posterior, surrounds the uh, internal and external carotid arteries and goes uh, towards the tongue. And this is the ansa cervicalis that we saw previously, this, the uh, accessory nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, here, and the superior cervical ganglion and sympathetic trunk, which are uh, the most medial structures. So there are two important nerves still in the approaches of the prevertebral space um, that, and cervical spine that cross from lateral to medial and are the superior and inferior laryngeal nerves, which are branches of the trenth cranial nerve. So the superior laryngeal nerve is divided in two. This is the, the internal branch and the external branch. The internal branch is superior and can be found inferior to the hyoid, piercing the thyrohyoid membrane. And the external branch is thinner, is inferior, and can be found deeper to the, uh, to the superior thyroid artery. It innervates uh, the uh, cricothyroid muscle and the, and the internal branch has a sensory function. So the function of the internal branch, we see here the internal branch below the hyoid, the external branch going to the cricothyroid muscle. And another nerve is the inferior uh, laryngeal nerve or recurrence which loops around the subclavian artery on the right side and around the, the aortic arch on the left side. It enters the larynx through this point, 
inferior in between the esophagus and the trachea and innervates uh, all the muscles that are not innervated um, by the uh, external laryngeal nerve, so all the muscles except the cricothyroid muscle. So lesions of the um, unilateral lesions of the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve produce a feeling of foreign body in the throat, and bilaterally, they may result in aspiration. Unilateral lesion of the external branch may be inadvertent, or um, the patient may have an impaired ability to produce acute sounds and his voice fati uh, fatigability. And the inferior laryngeal nerve, um, the unilateral damage of the inferior laryngeal nerve um, may be an asymptomatic or the patient may have most commonly uh, a hoarse or breathy voice and bilateral lesion may be very serious and may cause stridor. So this is a frontal view of the larynx with the hyoid bone, the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, and the thy uh, thyroid gland. And in this lateral view, we are going to see the same nerves that we uh, named before. This is, these two nerves are part of the superior laryngeal nerve, internal branch, which is sens sensitive, and the external branch, which is motor. This is the uh, recurrence or inferior laryngeal nerve, inferior thyroid artery, superior thyroid artery. This is the view of the structure of the larynx. This is the cricothyroid muscle innervated by the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. And in a posterior view of the larynx, we see the anastomosis that is very frequent um, between the uh, internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve and the recurrence nerve. So um, the recurrence nerve uh, runs in between the cricoid um, cartilage and the inferior aspect or the cornu of the thyroid cartilage. And it can be, can be compressed by spatulas or retractors pressed against uh, this uh, inferior aspect of the thyroid cartilage, and they may transiently damage uh, the inferior recurrent nerve. So this is another view of the same, of another dissection that we saw before. This is the tenth nerve, giving, looping around the subclavian artery. This is the recurrence nerve or inferior laryngeal nerve. This is the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, the carotid artery. And we see here the uh, inferior thyroid artery, which is closely related to the inferior laryngeal nerve, and the V1 segment of the vertebral artery, and sympathetic ganglia, which surround uh, the V1 segment of the vertebral artery. Uh, so the V1 segment before uh, the of the vertebral artery before entering, uh, usually the six uh, transverse foramina, can be encountered in a triangle uh, called, called the scalenovertebral triangle between the anterior scalenus muscle and the longus uh, coli and longus cavitis muscle. And we see here that uh, this is the triangle that we that we named before. Uh, the uh, B1 segment would be here behind the 10th nerve. This is the longus coli mus longus coli muscle, longus capitis muscle. This is the um, sympathetic chain, the superior cervical ganglion. Horner syndrome can be produced for lesions to the sympathetic trunk in anterior or anterolateral approaches to the cervical spine. Lesion of the longus coli in its lateral half can damage this trunk, so submuscular dissection is advised. So um, all the anatomical variations, like uh, such as the cervical rib, hypertrophy, or pathologies of any of these structures may cause uh, several syndromes uh, characterized by vascular insufficiency or uh, neural compression of these structures. So lesions of the phrenic nerve, lesions of the subclavian artery, uh, lesions that affect uh, the brachial plexus, 10th nerve, 
sympathetic chain here. Um, in this dissection, we removed the prevertebral muscles, the longus coli and longus cavitis muscle. We removed as well the intratransverse uh, muscles. And we see here the V2 segment of the vertebral artery passing through the transverse foramen. This is C2. This is C1. This is the, view, the first segment of the vertebral artery. This is the sympathetic chain. And this is the 10th cranial nerve. In this section, we can see that the cervical nerves um, pass behind the vertebral artery in the intervertebral foramina. So in summary, um, knowledge of the anatomy of the head and neck regions uh, in neurosurgery especially, uh, is especially important for uh, cervical spine approaches and also for vascular, um, extra and intracranial pathologies as well as extensive uh, skull base uh, lesions. Thank you very much. Thank you.